Horses. It had the appeal of a John le Carré novel, and that intrigued me. Within two days of the initial break-in, there I was talking to Ted Kennedy about it on the show. Senator Kennedy, there's a thing today that I'd love to get your reaction to. Uh, it's just preposterous. They talk about it as the James Bond plot that took place in Washington the night where they found these people sneaking in with eavesdropping devices, and one of them was a CIA man. What diabolical information and secret could there be in there uh, that they would have to go to all that risk and effort to get? You mean in the Democratic National Committee? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is enormously uh, uh, desperate kind of an attempt by the... Uh, this fellow was the head of security for the committee to re-elect the president, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't... Uh, I don't know, really, what... Uh, do you think Attorney General Mitchell knew about these men the other night? Well, I, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, I would hope that uh, we'd get an you know, investigation uh, of it by the Justice Department or by the, uh, by the FBI, and so we'd have a, uh, some kind of idea. I mean, I think the installation of, uh, of uh, surveillance materials, wiretapping, is, is frightening in our, in our uh, country, and uh, I think particularly it corrupts the political process. The next day, news broke that the name and phone number of a member of the White House staff was found in the address book of one of the Watergate burglars. The administration immediately came under fire from the press, and the cover-up was underway. Are you telling me that not only the president, but everybody in the White House views this thing as a third-rate burglary attempt and is not making any more inquiries into it? Now, you're really stretching the point here. I well, think it seems I... to me that's what you've been telling us, Ron. It's a little bit hard to believe. My remark yesterday regarding a third break burglary attempt related to the fact that I wasn't going to comment every time someone tries to break in somewhere. And I'm going to reject every attempt in questioning to inject this matter into the White House. I'm still a little confused, Ron. Well, then you'll have to continue to be confused because I'm okay. finished with any comment on the subject. Shall we start? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. O'Brien has said that the people who bugged his head for us had a direct link to the White House. Well, Mr. Ziegler and Mr. Mitchell, speaking for the campaign committee, responded to questions on this in great detail. They have stated my position and have also stated the facts. The White House has had no involvement whatever in this particular incident. I'd like to say something about the, uh, what's been called the Watergate caper now. Um, you know a lot about politics, obviously. What about the... Uh, what, what, could, what wonderful secrets could there have been? Well, I think we were trying to find out how they can afford to have headquarters in the Watergate. <laughs> well, that, it's the most expensive place in town. No, That wouldn't uh, seem to justify this whole... This, there's nothing new about this, and frankly, what can be gained? Nothing. Uh, we know every caper they can pull. They know everything we can pull. It's been done and done and done. And for the life of me, I can't uh, understand the necessity of going to the expense of bugging. If that's what we did, I really don't know. Who's we now, I see? The Republican Party. Oh, okay. I think if, if myself, if I were in a position of responsibility and knew that to be true, I'd admit it. A person of interest to the FBI and the grand jury investigating the burglary was a character named G. Gordon Liddy. Just in case anybody's... Uh memory needs refreshing uh, further. You, you, you were the man in charge of the um, elaborate, I guess you could call them sabotage plans of, uh, against the Democrats, mm -hmm. uh, and the actual Watergate break-in. G. Gordon Liddy is the center of bad action. He is hired by John Mitchell, former attorney general, now head of the committee to re-elect the president, to set up an espionage capability for the re-election committee. The hell with the law, the hell with decency, uh, the hell with uh, the real political process, the hell with the Constitution of the United States. And that was and is Gordon Liddy. Why was it all necessary? Uh, the plan was made to put electronic surveillance capability into the DNC headquarters early. Why? Because we knew that whoever emerged as the candidate would leave their little hole-in-the-wall candidate headquarters, move into the DNC's vast array of beautiful offices, and when they did so, of course, would be surrounded by the Secret Service. It would be almost too late to do it then. So the idea was put it in early, and then no matter who ends up, including Teddy Kennedy in there, we've got the electronic surveillance capability. That's the why. Mm -hmm. Gordon kind of thought he was a, uh, a James Bond kind of figure. Uh, 
Uh, he actually wasn't quite up to the Maxwell Smart level as, uh, as it happened. Actually, it was a third-rate burglary. <laughs> it's a third-rate burglary that was ordered by the president's lieutenants. But it's a third-rate burglary. I mean, come on. First-rate burglaries do not involve leaving evidence that, that actually takes you from the crime scene to the White House. I remember at the beginning, there was a sense of the mastermind of all of this is Gordon Liddy. Well, history now has established that the mastermind was Richard Nixon. When Attorney General Mitchell left the Justice Department uh, to run the uh, campaign to reelect the president, uh, my next guest became the acting attorney general. And it took some time for him to get confirmed, as you remember, because what was called a juicy scandal arose over certain antitrust legislation. Then there was what's called the Watergate scandal, uh, another juicy item, according to the press. But uh, Mr. Nixon uh, is way ahead in the polls at this point, and it seems that uh, very little rocks the boat. And, well, you're all aware of the current situation. Now, my next guest, obviously, then, is the Attorney General of the United States. Will you welcome him, Richard Kleindienst? <laughs> Who do you think gave the orders to bug the Watergate? Well, I think that the persons who the grand jury indicted in Washington, D.C. last week mm -hmm. gave the orders to do it. And I think one of the most interesting things about that, after having one of the most uh, complete, <clears throat> comprehensive, intense investigations that the FBI has ever had, and one of the most thorough presentations before a grand jury, uh, they came up with seven persons who they indicted, you know, uh, and I, I think that those are the persons who gave the orders to do that. Ah, Kleindienst. What a second-tier liar. Kleindienst, of course, knew that uh, that was not the end of the story, that it was uh, the seven men involved. The reason he knew that is because Gordon Liddy, two days after the arrests at the Watergate, found Kleindienst, says these are my men, and lays the whole story on him. An attorney general? of all people is going to come on television and claim he didn't know about certain things that we later learned he did. But uh, the White House had a way of picking them, didn't they? Since so much has been made of this, though, and it's been called a scandal and, and corrupt and all of that, that uh, any administration would be anxious to have it all Well, I'd like to make a footnote there. Before it's what, anytime anybody illegally wiretaps or bugs somebody else, that's a bad thing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a violation of the law, and they should be prosecuted. Uh, and I'm very sorry that it happened. Uh, the president ordered uh, the most complete investigation that the Department of Justice ever had. He said, let the chips fall where they will. It's corrupt so far as the event is concerned, but I think the integrity of, of the, the enforcement of the law uh, has been maintained throughout in this matter. Kleindienst was, was the effective point man through which the investigation could be tamped down. He's trotted out to tell everyone the system works, everybody guilty has been indicted, the grand jury did its job, the FBI did its job, and now let's just get on with the election and stop this nonsense about there having been a political espionage campaign against the Democrats. Nowadays, Bob Woodward, Carl Bernstein are legendary. But in 1972, they were just a pair of young reporters working a small local store. Which one of you is Carl Bernstein? That's me. OK. And you must be? Bob Woodward. You're Bob Woodward. Uh, what now was the, you know, I've lost track of where this all started. I think maybe a lot of people have. Can you remember the first moment when you knew there was something? Uh, a call at 8.30 in the morning on Saturday, June 17th, by my boss saying, Five men had been arrested in the Watergate, uh, the Democrats' headquarters, with sophisticated photographic and electronic equipment. Said, so uh, start to work on it. And did you have any idea at that moment that uh, there was going to be a Niagara of things coming out eventually? I think not immediately afterwards, but within a week or two, I, I think we had a pretty good idea that, that this was going to go somewhere and it was not going to be limited to the five people that were arrested inside on June 17th. Early on, many of our colleagues in the press, including some at the Washington Post, did not believe the stories we were 
writing. We were 28, 29 years, years old. We weren't national reporters. We didn't have high-level sources way up in the Nixon administration. And we were being attacked every day for using hearsay and innuendo. Uh, and, and the White House very successfully was making our conduct at the Washington Post. They tried to make the issue in Watergate, not the conduct of the president and his men. And then we wrote the story that finally made sense out of what was Watergate. We had just written a story that day, it was in September, saying that Mr. Mitchell, while he was attorney general, controlled uh, some secret funds that indeed had financed uh, undercover activities, including Watergate. And we got a, another denial from the Committee for the Re-election of the President, which wasn't really a denial, and we found it wasn't satisfactory. And we were told it had been authorized by Mr. Mitchell, so we decided we would call him. And I called him in New York and got him about 10 o'clock that night, read him what the top of the story said, that he had controlled these funds. And he said, all that crap, you're going to put it in the paper. It's all been denied. At which point he said, if you put that in the paper, uh, we're going to put your publisher and then refer to a particular part of her anatomy through the ringer and said that when all this is over, we're going to do a little story on all of you. And then he proceeded to uh, get some of his public relations spokesmen to, to call us and say, maybe you shouldn't, have, you shouldn't put John Mitchell's statements in the paper. You had awakened him in the middle of the night when you called him. And, and then they called uh, Ben Bradley, the executive editor at home, I guess it was about 1 a.m., and asked him to keep it out of the paper. Uh, he said no. We wrote saying Watergate, the break-in and bugging were part of a massive campaign of political espionage and sabotage directed from the White House against the president's political opposition. It was a lust for political power. And in the case of Nixon in 72, it was a sense of entitlement, a sense that we have a right to the presidency and uh, we're going to do anything to retain it. Woodward and Bernstein, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, have been working their stories, working the phones, using a lot of shoe leather. And they've kept alive the local story about this break-in at the Democratic National Headquarters. This story hasn't taken off. And it hasn't taken off because of television. Television, with the exception of, of Mr. Cavett's few interviews, television hasn't noticed the story. Do you have any raps you'd give the coverage that it's gotten? Any, uh... Uh, I think during the initial phase, the television coverage was, was pretty poor. CBS, in the last two weeks of the campaign, I think did a, a great service by airing the issue on two long segments on the Cronkite show. And very and, courageously, in fact. Right, under, because... under pressure from the White House not to go with it. Cronkite decided that he would do his broadcast about what we were writing in the paper, essentially, uh, and what Watergate was and what should be known to the people of America by that juncture. He has been called many things, among them uh, Uncle Walter, uh, the most trusted man in America. Uh, someone said people don't believe a thing is true until they hear it from Walter Cronkite. We did on CBS Evening News uh, uh, do something that I'm proud to say. Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry for the industry, but I'm proud for us that no one else did. Uh, uh, we put it all together in three mm. long pieces on the Evening News, longest pieces we'd ever used up to that time, uh, in trying to pull this story together and make some sense out of it, because it was being dribbled out, of course, by revelation after revelation. And I determined that we should do that because I found that many of these stories weren't getting repeated around the country, that local papers weren't picking up the stories, either for political reasons or whatever. Journalistic judgment again, very possibly, but at least they weren't picking them up. And uh, I thought that it was important that they be pulled together and that the whole thing be put in as much focus as we could do it. At first it was called the Watergate Caper, five men apparently caught in the act of burglarizing and bugging Democratic headquarters in Washington. But the episode grew steadily more sinister, no longer a caper, but the Watergate affair, escalating finally into charges of a high-level campaign of political sabotage and espionage, apparently unparalleled in American history. It was uh, 
a big boost for those of us uh, at the Post and in the newsroom that he would do something like that. Woodward and Bernstein had raised really good questions, and people were beginning to scratch their heads, but the objective of the cover-up was to hold the line so that nobody higher up would be indicted. To that point, only the burglars and Liddy have been indicted. So the cover-up is working. The internal polling that Nixon is getting is showing, as well as the Gallup and the public polls, that it's not registering at all. It just doesn't play. Outside of Washington, it's a non-story. He has overhauled the draft laws and made them fair for everyone, black and white, rich and poor. He certified an amendment giving 18-year-olds the right to vote. He has created an economy that is growing faster than at any time in years. For four years, President Nixon has responded to the needs of the people. That's why we need President Nixon, now more than ever. I had almost forgotten, even with the break-in having happened, they were predicting that Nixon would win by a landslide, and he did. This, for me, is rather unusual. I've never known a national election when I would be able to go to bed earlier than tonight. Watergate wasn't an issue in the 72 election. They denied it. They were able to bury it. We didn't have proof. We didn't have video. We didn't have tapes. We didn't have documents. And I think to uh, the average person in America, it was inconceivable that the president, a president clearly as smart as Richard Nixon, would be involved in things like this. You know, he won the 72 election by the greatest plurality of any president of the United States. That's right. And he's the product of this strange selection process that we have in this country in picking presidents. We penalize people who have normal emotions and normal reactions to situations, and we weed them out. Muskie, you know, goes up in New Hampshire and cries because his wife's been attacked. And, and we say, well, you know, that guy is not the sort of fellow that can survive, and so folks like that we get rid of. And uh, we end up with sort of single dimension, single purpose, uh, carefully bred and genetically selected uh, creatures. I couldn't figure out how Richard Nixon, a savvy a politician and highly intelligent person, could get himself into the problems he got into. Uh, there is no simple answer. You literally have to watch it. It's just, uh, it, it's kind of like watching a train wreck, if you will, uh, to see how he makes one bad decision on top of another bad decision. Nixon had the quality that he thought of himself as acting best in crises, and there was a lot in that. Mm -hmm. But it reached the point where one sometimes had the impression that he invited crises, and that he couldn't stand normalcy. You know, the, the psychological portrait of Richard Nixon that uh, comes from all of this is uh, very complicated, let's put it that way. Are you friendly with, the pres with President Nixon? Uh... No. I don't think uh, Nixon has a friend. Really? I've known him for a long time. Uh, I've interviewed him many times. Mm -hmm. In one of which, at the very end of the interview, I asked him, Mr. Nixon, can you ever relax with anyone? Mm -hmm. And he said it was rather pathetic to me, I think. He said, uh, no, I never can. I can never really lay, uh, uh, let my hair down with anybody. And then I said, not even with Pat. And he thought for a moment, and he said, no, not even with Pat. And in a curious way, that exchange comes back to me today. Mm -hmm. Here is a man who is totally isolated. He's, uh, he's separated from the realities which confront him. One has to understand the human problem of a man who had spent all of his life trying to become president, whose personality really did not lend itself to politics. He didn't like to meet new people. He didn't like to give direct orders. He didn't like face-to-face -face confrontations. All the things you have to do as president. He made himself do all these things. And 
just when he had achieved for the first time a
be. Uh, there's enough litter on the floor to uh, fill a garbage scow at the end of the day, but I asked them to leave it that way so that it would, uh, so that you could see maybe what it actually looks like at the end of the day. I think I'll just sit down here for a moment. Um, I'm seated now, I guess, in what has been called the hottest chair in the country. Uh, the previous occupants have squirmed through two seat covers on this chair, if I could warn them out, but it's... Um, no one has asked me, but I would like to make it clear right now that I had no knowledge, whatever, of the Watergate cover-up. Um, in fact, I still don't have as much knowledge as I'd like to. Uh, Senator Baker, um, by the way, when I was sitting in that witness chair, I felt guilty. Uh, it's a very strange feeling sitting there. You might there. be the first one. <laughs> Let me ask you gentlemen something. Have any of you smarted from the criticisms of the uh, lawyers who have been saying uh, questioning has been a little toothless, flabby, and inept? <laughs> Does anyone want to grab that, or me? Well, I don't think we're conducting a trial. I, yeah. think, that, I think that's, that's the, the difference. That's the thing that should be said about it. And I think that um, uh, there, are, there are those lawyers that have appeared before us who would like to give it the... Um, the rules or the atmosphere of a trial, but our, our job is to go ahead and just get out the broad story and not go ahead and uh, concentrate on the guilt or innocence of anybody. And that, I might add, uh, includes the President of the United States. You, you say you won't state an opinion, but do you find it possible not to form one? I think it matters very little what uh, I think about the witnesses here. Even if this is not a prosecution and if this is a Senate investigation, there are millions of people who are now making judgments, and that's the judgment that counts. Yeah. And that's the judgment that is now affecting the stock market, mm -hmm. the value of the dollar, the price of gold, and that's how deeply it is. Senator Talmadge, um, I, I don't know why I picked you for this, but uh, Martha Mitchell is going to say on an interview that's on film on my show at some point this week that they ought to shut this whole mess up, these hearings. And she's also going to say that they are rehearsed, like any Broadway play. Mrs. Mitchell, of course, has right to her opinion as to whether these hearings ought to be discontinued. That's widely debated in this country at the present time. I've received thousands and thousands of letters that they ought to be discontinued. On the contrary, I've received thousands and thousands of letters that think otherwise, mm -hmm. that the American people have a right to know and act as a jury as to what happened in these particular cases. And that's our role in this particular matter. Yeah. Now, I do think personally that it's in the national interest, it's in the interest of the President of the United States as an individual and the office itself to conclude these hearings at the earliest possible date, particularly the President's involvement in it. During that summer of 1973, the Watergate hearings gave everyone but the dead a reason to bounce out of bed every morning and just feverishly devour the latest developments. I'm just a country lawyer from way down in North Carolina. I'll probably make inquiries with a little bit more vigor than some of these highfalutin city lawyers do. The thing about Sam Irvin was that he presented himself mm, almost as a slightly maybe rustic, none too sharp, um, southern character. The chairman is fond of pointing out from time to time that he is just a country lawyer. He omits to say that he graduated from Harvard Law School with honors. If the citizen from Tennessee will yield, I'd like to say a word in my own defense on that point. Of course he wasn't a country lawyer. No one knew that better than he. And when his moment in the sun came, he did what had to be done in a very aggressive but ultimately fair-minded way. Is that uh, 18 United States Code 2511? Yes, sir. Now, this statute has nothing to do with burglary. How do you know that, Mr. Chairman? Because I can understand the English language as my mother tongue. He had everything it takes. He was folksy. He seemed real, honest, and entertaining, and thoroughly intelligent. And so I got to spend half an hour in his office with him. And it was wonderful. We always hear that Watergate is the worst scandal. Well, first we heard that it might become the worst scandal in American political history, and then we heard that it was becoming that, and then that it did, and now that people say it definitely is. 
Is this the worst scandal in political memory for oh, this I country? Think, I think undoubtedly so. Yeah, it's a terrible thing to make a make an assault as an as was done in this case on the the integrity of the processes by which uh, a president's nominated and elected. Where did you see the Constitution threatened the most in the Watergate? There was a a climate of uh, in the White House among White House aides and also in the committee to re-elect the president that, uh, that indicated a total uh, uh, misunderstanding of the Constitution. There was a feeling there that the president was above uh, the Constitution. Were you discouraged by the attitude, why should you make trouble for people in high places? That was a general attitude but in a lot of people's part about Watergate and has been all along. Don't press this, it leads too far and so on. Well, yes, I've had a lot of very conscientious and sincere people uh, Say, if you uh, get close to the White House, you must uh, suppress the testimony. You must bring out anything uh, that yeah. tends to show that uh, the White House or the president was involved in any way, directly and indirectly, in the Watergate. These people are very sincere. They think that the Constitution will collapse and that the presidents will be destroyed if the truth is uh, revealed and it uh, comes very close to the White House. Why on earth should I believe anything that Haldeman says? that John Dean says, that John Mitchell might say. These are all men who lied when it was expedient, who today I, perhaps I, I must their... correct you, I've never lied under oath. You, you under never lied? Any time. Under Absolutely, oath. I have never lied under, under any testimonial situation hmm. uh, at any time. Careful, you're under oath now. <laughs> <laughs> if it weren't for the Senate Watergate Committee, John Dean might not have had the platform that changed this whole crisis. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency, and if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. Dean, a remarkable truth teller. He was part of the cover-up and got involved in it, and is somebody uh, who realized he was going to take the fall, they were going to blame him, and so he came forward. I mean, Nixon thought I should lie for him. I should fall on the sword. I should uh, go to jail indefinitely uh, so he can continue to be who he wants to be. Uh, and I didn't see it that way. The meeting with the president that afternoon with Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and myself was a tremendous disappointment to me because it was quite clear that the cover-up, as far as the White House was, was concerned, was going to continue. John Dean, with his prodigious memory, comes before the committee and gives a 100-page or so statement which lays out what he knows about the evolution of the cover-up. And suddenly, the story, it's cinematic now. It's, it's, got, it's got a narrative. The central question at this point is simply put, what did the president know, and when did he know it? It then becomes the president versus Dean. At the heart of Dean's statement is, is his accusation that the president was warned of the dangers of a cover-up and that he was aware of a cover-up last September and didn't do anything about it. That amounts to an accusation that the President of the United States was a party to a crime. You're fully aware, Mr. Dean, of the gravity of the charges you have made under oath against the highest official of our land, the President of the United States. Yes, I am. Who is telling the truth? Ordinarily, most Americans, after all, the President had just been re-elected, by a huge margin. Most Americans would say the president. Anyway, they didn't know who John Dean was. He was this young lawyer. Um, but then, within weeks of John Dean's riveting testimony, there's another bombshell. My name is Alexander Porter Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the president? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. Are you aware of any devices that were installed in the executive office building office of the president? Yes, sir, at that time. What about the cabinet room? <coughs> yes, sir, there was. On whose authority were they installed, Mr. Butterfield? On the president's authority by way of Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Higby. I tried to catch every millisecond of the hearings, but as the gods would have it, in my house out in the country, I went down to the beach for a break, and when I got back, my wife said there was taping. Nixon made tapes of everything. 
And I said, I'm in no mood for a joke. Listening to those tapes, you understand the criminality of this president and this presidency. And it was a mindset. It was a sensibility. It's all about vengeance. It's all about his enemies. It's all about getting even. It's about break-ins. It's about getting information. It's about screwing the other side. That's what dominates the tapes. Uh, not just tapes about the Watergate break-in, but the tapes, period. Uh, when it came to the enemies, whether they were in the press or whether they were in the politics, he treated them as, a, as, a, as a, uh, enemies, not as adversaries. And I think Hubert Humphrey said that... And wasted a lot of time and in energy. Uh, uh, wasted a tremendous amount of time on going after people I think he felt were his enemies. By the way, did my name ever come up as an enemy in all your years in the White House? I, I don't think you were on the, the bad... I don't remember you on the bad list. <laughs> Is that an insult? <laughs> Should you have been on the enemies list? How long do I have to decide? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Now that's from the chief executive of the United States, the most powerful man in the world. It gave me both a laugh and a chill simultaneously. Nixon is somebody who, who sort of cultivated enemies. <laughs> and Cavett was certainly not somebody who was a Nixon supporter. Punishing people with the IRS was one of Nixon's uh, favorite illegal amusements. A member of my staff, a young woman, chances to say to another young woman, you know, I had my taxes audited once. And the other one said, oh, so did I, and remarked on the odd coincidence of it, and a third and fourth case of the same thing came up, and thus did the Whittier College alum in the White House attempting to screw Cabot end up by screwing my staff instead. I mean, in a sense, the presidency became an instrument of personal revenge. I did not know last night. I read a thing on the air about the tapes vanishing, and the audience thought it was a sick joke. Can't you hear the dialogue in the White House? Pat, now you know I put those tapes in that drawer. <laughs> and just, oh, Dick, you know, if your head wasn't screwed on, you'd lose everything. Well, I just knew it was here somewhere. You know, I could just hear all this going on. And That's then, it. oh, I must say, then when they find out, that the, that the tapes that they, do, they are getting have, have been doctored, if they do find out. Well, there'll be a couple, I mean, you'll, you'll sort of hear, uh, of course, we could give him a million dollars, but that would be wrong, take two, you know, and it'll be sort of like that. <laughs> well, if he gets caught in that, I must say, I, he just, every day he does something that interests, it's sort of like a rat going around, you keep trying to kill it and he gets away, you know. <laughs> it's just marvelous, he's a great hero. Yeah. The Nixon tapes are a tire iron wrapped around his neck, and he'll never escape them because there are hundreds and hundreds of hours of him plotting or conceiving of, you know, let's do this, let's cover up this. I do know more about Watergate today than when I lived through it for a very simple reason. Uh, I have now listened to all of Richard Nixon's Watergate conversations. I was stunned to find that he was as deeply involved in the cover-up as he really was. Get this Watergate thing on the way up. It's fine. It's going to be a nasty issue for a few days. I can't believe that uh, they can tie the thing. Everybody says we've got to protect this one. The main thing we've got to protect is the presidents. What really, where did this thing leaves? Mitchell, Bush, Colson, all of them. And I say these. I would say the 
these people are going to cost a million dollars over the next few years. On the money, if you need the money, I mean, uh, you can get a million dollars, and you can get it in cash. I, I know where it can be got. It's all that you're going to have to the president. I don't even listen to him do it. Let me put it this way. I don't care what comes out. I don't care what kind of charges are made. If I walk out of this office on this ticket, If you listen carefully, he's never saying that wire, illegal wiretapping for political purposes is wrong. He never says that. It's getting caught that's wrong. The president actually, as you know, has asked us to turn down all thermostats. His critics claim he'll do anything to get the heat off, but... Um... <laughs> I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I'm just wondering whether uh, justice is being done or will be done. I did support him before, but I do think he should be impeached at this time. I, I guess I feel that the impeachment procedure should go ahead. Most people don't know what impeachment means. It would tear this country apart. Corruption in the Nixon administration was hardly limited to Watergate. In October of 1973, Vice President Spiro Agnew resigned amid charges of extortion, bribery, and, uh, oh yes, income tax evasion. A man with the slightly unfamiliar name Gerald Ford, a congressman, was appointed to replace him. The man beside me is Vice President Gerald Ford. I'm always welcoming guests, and it seems strange to welcome you to your own home, but welcome to your own home. Thank you, Dick. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be on anyway. the program. Nixon and his people thought that making Gerald Ford the vice president of the United States would be a kind of impeachment ins insurance. Uh, that was one of the calculations, because Ford had a kind of reputation as kind of a party hack. He wasn't particularly uh, distinguished. He wasn't thought of for his intellectual acumen. It is conceivable that there may be criminal prosecutions against the president of the United States. Um, you can say that Agnew, in a sense, bartered his job to stay out of jail. Would you make a similar deal with Mr. Nixon? I should say, Dick, that uh, first, uh, I have n no doubt whatsoever that the president is not guilty of mm. any criminal charges that might be forthcoming. I'm absolutely positive. I'm absolutely certain of that. As a matter of fact, I think the president is uh, uh, being unfairly accused based on any evidence I've seen of being involved in the planning, the execution, or the cover-up of Watergate. Now, that's my own personal conviction, and I, it's based on a number of things, but I feel very strongly. If it's a matter of deciding whether it's Nixon or the law, I think the law is much more important than the man. Throw the whole bunch out and get somebody new in. I think that they've been crooked from the beginning. I don't know why people still have any faith in, in what Nixon's doing. This country's coming on to its 200th anniversary, and I want to be proud of it when it does. And I'm not too proud of it right now. By August 1st, 1974, pressure was mounting on Richard Nixon. The House Judiciary Committee had voted three articles of impeachment against him, and he was quickly losing Republican support in Congress. <sighs> Let me see, did you get these lights properly? Uh, yes, I, my eyes always have, you'll find if you get past 60, that's enough. I've often said and thought, would have been great if there had been a strong lawyer in the Nixon White House who would have gone into Nixon and said, do you know what's going on? Do you know what you're doing? You're the president of the United States. Knock this off. This is against the law. If this ever comes out, you're finished in history. There is a debate over whether Richard Nixon actually precisely ordered the break-in at the Watergate. But he didn't have to order it precisely to be responsible for it. Richard Nixon created a climate. He just wanted the data. He wanted any way possible. And he wanted a lot of it. And he put pressure on them to get it. He established objectives that could only have been met through illegal activity. Oh, you're on a level, don't you? Yes, yes. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office, where so many decisions have been made that shaped the history of our nation. Need any more? 
other presidents have crossed this line or that. To our knowledge, nothing approaching this. There is nothing like this. What Watergate, the term, is about is a criminal presidency. Uh, and Richard Nixon was a criminal president. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Mr. Vice President, are you prepared to take the oath of office as president of the United States? I am, sir. If you will raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Gerald R. Ford, do solemnly swear. I, Gerald R. Ford, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. This is an hour of history that troubles our minds and hurts our hearts. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Ford will be known in history as the one who pardoned Richard Nixon. <laughs> Did Woodward tell you the story? Did he tell you? I was asleep, and Carl called me up and, and said, have you heard? And I said, I haven't heard anything. I've been asleep. And, and Carl really has the ability to say what occurred in the fewest words with the most drama. Son of a bitch, pardon the son of a bitch. <laughs> Woodward, familiar with my way of speaking, instantly recognized what I meant. Uh, and uh, we were livid. Now, therefore, I, Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States, pursuant <clears throat> to the pardon power conferred upon me by Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, have granted and by these presents do grant a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon. I hated Ford for the pardon when I got the news of it. Um, I just couldn't believe it. What was the hardest part about pardoning Richard Nixon? Well, there was a basic decision that I had to uh, <clears throat> decide. One, whether the fate of an individual was uh, more important than the problems of the nation as a whole. We thought this was part of a conspiracy. We knew that offers had been made to Nixon about a pardon, etc. And um, we were so wrong. Um, it's one of the great heroic acts of a president of the United States for its pardon of Nixon. Um, Ford's a great president, partly because of that. He had the right motive for pardoning Nixon. It was not for Nixon or for himself, it was for the country. Ford was canny enough in his explanation of it that I was braced not to accept, but he convinced me. I think you have to look at it this way too, Dick. Um, while I was deciding whether I should or should not pardon Mr. Nixon, I asked my counsel, Phil Buchan, to check with uh, Mr. Jaworski, who was, as you know, the special <laughs> prosecutor. He said, if he is indicted, it would be at least a year before he could be brought to trial. Mm -hmm. And if he were brought to trial, it would take some time for the trial to proceed. And then if he were convicted, he could appeal on up to the Supreme Court. And the best yeah. estimate we got was, that it would anywhere from two to six years at, uh, during that time span. And all the time that was going on, Dick, we would have had the headlines, former President Nixon this, former President Nixon that. And I was trying to heal the country, yeah. not tear it apart. There's a very interesting and dramatic scene in your book in which um, you have to help me with the name. Was it Becker? Benton Becker. Yeah, I sent him out to California to uh, 
sign a contract uh, with the Nixon people. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Becker went out and he actually talked to former President Nixon at that time. Yeah. And I think that's the scene well, you're that's describing. Thinking of, he says to him, and, and doesn't seem able to get his attention fully, do you realize that acceptance of a pardon is, and in fact has been declared by an early Supreme Court decision back so, in 1915 or something? It's a verdict case. Uh, it was yeah. decided, as you said, in 1915. Mm -hmm. It's a complicated case, but the net result was it, uh, the court, the Supreme Court decided that a person uh, could be uh, pardoned even though he had not been indicted or convicted. And secondly, and these are the important words, Dick, uh, the court said, and I quote, uh, the granting of a pardon is an imputation of guilt and the acceptance a confession of it. Something I thought didn't get enough play, enough publicity, was the fact startling to me that in point of fact, to accept a pardon is to admit guilt. And yet Nixon went to his grave, of course, continually maintaining, with the help of at least one of his daughters, that he never did anything wrong. Everybody seems to see it as a PR problem or a political maneuvering, or if we'd only been smart at this point. And, and I always say to myself, they still don't get it. They don't realize that there was some larger question at issue. Funny how people have asked me, are you proud of uh, your role and all this and so on. And only in the sense that I set out to do an entertaining talk show when I went into television, never dreaming that I would get up to my neck in a national scandal and that it would influence people's lives and careers and fates and prison terms and books they wrote and things written against and for them and all of that. When it was mostly all over, I kind of shook myself and thought, kind of glad that's over. Maybe it's, you've uh, seen too many yeah. Frank Capra right. movies to hope that maybe John I Dean or one of you in one of those squalid yeah. meetings would have said, my God, here we are in the tradition of Jefferson, Lincoln, and Washington, yeah. <laughs> talking about bugging and kidnapping and prostitutes and right. wiretapping and all that crap. And we, no one has ever seen this as not the way that leaders should lead. Um, I'm just a sentimental boy, I suppose. <laughs> This program was made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. To find out more about Dick Cavett's Watergate, visit pbs.org. Dick Cavett's Watergate is available on DVD for $24.99 plus shipping. To order, call 1-800-336-1917.